Well, we have two readings this morning, and the first one is coming from the book of Isaiah. It's coming from chapter 11, and I'm going to read you five verses from this, um, and it's actually headed up the route from Jesse. Okay? A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will uh, slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Okay, now we're going to Luke, and this is Luke chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading the first uh, six verses from it. And it's actually headed up, John the Baptist prepares the way. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, this is when Pontius Pilate was governor in Judea, Herod was tetrach in Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrach of of, uh, Eteria and Traconicus, and then Lysanias was tetrach of Abilene. Now, during this time, the high priest was Annas, And Caiaphas. And the words of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah, when he was out in the desert. He went into the country around the Jordan, and he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And as it was written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, there was a voice crying in the desert Prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked part roads shall become straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all mankind will see God's salvation. Amen. May we bow our heads and hearts as we bring our prayers before the Lord. There is war, conflict between nations, fighting amongst factions, hatred between individuals. When will you bring peace? Let's quietly bring before the Lord those places and situations known to us that need his peace. There are good things in our world, but we are still surrounded by cruelty and greed, gossip and jealousy, ruthlessness and deception. When will your kingdom fully come? We quietly bring before him those areas in our lives where we know his kingdom is yet to fully come. We're encouraged by those who work for justice and peace. But as crisis follows crisis, we're overwhelmed by the scale of human suffering. From warfare and persecution, famine and drought. 
How can we hope for a better time ahead? In the quietness, let's bring before the Lord those known to us who are searching for hope and are looking in all the wrong places. Lord, would you give us your peace in our hearts and the strength to be peacemakers? Would you give us your hope in our hearts and the patience that springs from confidence in you? Would you give us your love in our hearts and a concern for others that never ends. And so in the quietness, let's bring before the Lord those known to us within our family or friends, our neighbours or colleagues who are in need of his help or healing this day. In your Son, we saw peace, hope and love born in the world, your presence alive and at work. May you work in and through us this day and always. And may we share together in the prayer that Jesus taught as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. You know, before any uh, real change can take place in our spiritual development, we have to come to that place of recognising where we are and wanting it to be better. John the Baptist's message of repentance brought home the urgency for people to sort their lives out since the coming of the Messiah was imminent. They wanted to put things right and be ready, just as we might rush around and get our house ready and clear up before guests arrive. You know, we had family with us last week, and you know what it's like? You get a bit of a spring clean, don't you, before guests arrive. You know, especially if it's guests <clears throat> that you want to impress in some way. You know that there's certain guests that stay with you that will notice the clutter. There's others who turn a blind eye, aren't there? But there's some that don't. So uh, sometimes you have to be a little, little bit more kind of, you know, careful in your cleanup. And often the cleanups mean something that you know you've been needing to do for a while. You've kind of just needed a reason to go and do it. <laughs> I think it's the same with our spiritual clutter, our spiritual grime, all that rubbish that's built up in our lives. You know, John the Baptist helps to nudge us into action. We recognise that we don't want things to stay the way that they are. And he shows us that the effort we put into changing is worth it. 
So we heard about how God is a God who sorts. And John the Baptist's task had been to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Now, I don't know, is this going to work on my hay? It is. I didn't doubt you guys. <laughs> John was urging people to sort their lives out, stressing the possibility of judgment as the all-seeing God was to come amongst his people in person. And we hear that call of his again, get the road ready. Many of us would have seen new roads, wouldn't we, being built and constructed at some time? You know, where you get parts banked up and others being tunneled through in order to cut through steep hills. Most of us have certainly sat in traffic jams while roads are being mended or widened. I don't think there's ever been a time that I've been through the M25 and that's not been going on. John the Baptist was helping people to see that we need to get a nice new road ready. One that God can travel straight into our lives without finding any holes to fall down or blocks in the way. He was saying to people, you need to get yourselves ready and become like a really good, solid, straight road. I don't know about you, but often there are holes in my life and there are often blocks. And although John was speaking over 2,000 years ago, still really relevant, isn't it, to us this morning, there are holes of selfishness and meanness, gaping holes in my love. Perhaps some of us have gaps in our honesty because we don't always tell the truth or live the truth. Sometimes there are holes of superiority because we sneer at people who aren't like us. And there are roadblocks which block God from getting through to us. Blocks such as, oh, I'm fine the way I am, thank you. I don't want to change. It's not my fault I'm bad-tempered, you just have to pit up with me. When we hear John rushing out of the desert, shouting, get the road ready for God, it's a good idea to listen to him. It's the opportunity to look at our own life road, to see where the holes are, to recognize what the blocks are, and to ask God to do something about them. Our holes need filling, and our blocks need removing. So God is a God who sorts and just as we were looking at my recycling bag, God is looking for that which we need to get rid of and for that which he can keep and build on and use and bless. You know, it's not his will that anybody lives their life in a way that we end up on the spiritual rubbish heap. God wants all of us. And the question we must ask and answer is, is my life pleasing to God? What can God keep? What can he build on? What can he use? What can he bless? Well, the person that we're going to turn to for answers is indeed John the Baptist. Now, we know, don't we, that John was a, a prophet. And when he showed up, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for over 400 years. That's a long time. And he had one simple but tough message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. What did John mean by that declaration? Well, John had several roles. Hey, there we go. <laughs> John was a sentry. Now, 
I don't know, and I'm sure you guys were too good to be involved in anything like this, but when I was back at school, it was before the time of class assistance. And if the school teacher got called out, which sometimes they did, but sometimes they had a, 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 you know, a phone call came to them in the office and they had to leave us alone, they'd always expect us to read a textbook. And they'd write on the, the blackboard, that shows how old I am, doesn't it, with blackboards, they'd write on the blackboard the pages that we were to read. I went to a comprehensive <laughs> and um, if I'm honest, we had better things to do than read a textbook if the school teacher wasn't in the room. But of course, we got clever, didn't we? And so we would post a sentry at the door. Somebody had the task of looking out for when the teacher was coming down the corridor and would warn us all so that before they got back to the class, we were sat like little angels with our textbooks all out, as if butter wouldn't melt in our mouths. <laughs> John was a little bit like this. He was a sentry. He was posted out there to warn us that the kingdom of heaven was coming and we needed to get ready. So John was a bit of a sentry. Now, there were many reasons why John got people's attention. One of them was simply that he lived in the desert. Doesn't want to work on me, but don't worry. No, don't worry, he's given up on me. Hey? Point it this way. No. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, we can do without. <laughs> John was, uh, got people's attention because he lived in the desert. Why was that important? That was because the prophet Isaiah had promised things were going to be this way. So John was a century. John lived in the desert. John got people's attention because he was poor, also fulfilling prophecy. He was so poor, he was at the point of eating locusts and honey. And finally, John got the attention of the people because he was dressed like Elijah. And every Jew knew that before the day of the Lord came, a prophet like Elijah would show up. So John got their attention because he fulfilled everything that they'd been waiting for. And he told people that there were two things they could do to live a life that pleases God. The kind of life that pleases God starts with true, broken confession. The first thing that John says to the people is repent. Confess your sins. John even asked them to be baptised. Now this wouldn't have been easy for the people to whom John was speaking. Confession and baptism were very public acts. And back then, pretty much the only person who got baptised was an occasional pagan who chose to convert and become a Jew. John became something of a phenomenon. And it wasn't too long before he attracted some of the most respected religious people in the country. John attacked the more religious among the crowd because they'd rather be known for being good than to really face God in their brokenness. But we can all be like Pharisees at times. It's hard, isn't it, to let others know of our real junk. Broken humility is attractive to God. And it's also a gift to other people. We can never experience living as part of a community of faith unless we start being honest with each other. And that takes trust. And it takes faith. But it will make all the difference to our spiritual growth and the relationships that we share. People who confess their sins to God and know their brokenness may be messed up, but they're irresistible to God. God loves true broken confession. The kind of life that pleases God starts then with true broken confession. 
but it continues with actions that prove you're serious about changing your life. As good as it is, it is to humbly confess our sins, we also need to live in a way that proves we really want to live a different kind of life. So when John calls us to repentance, yes, confession is important, but there's more to repentance than confession. Repentance is like us walking down a road and we choose to turn and walk the other way. That's how big a change repentance is. Our lives need to show that sort of change. We're going in one way and suddenly we're not because we're choosing Jesus. Oh, sorry, I'm getting too excited and jumping. I'll keep my hands to myself. Um, and we're moving and changing direction because we want to for him. John wanted us to lead lives that were different. He wanted people to be generous. He wanted people to no longer take advantage of others. He wanted people to be sexually faithful to their spouses. John wasn't primarily concerned at all. He didn't want us to be religious. He wanted us to give up grasping for money and possessions, attention, and he wanted us to get ready to sort out the rubbish, to make the path straight so that God could come to us. If you've ever truly repented, people will be able to tell. There will be a life change that is evident. John's uncompromising message leaves little to the imagination. If you live a broken life, honestly confessing your rubbish, and then live out a life of meaningful service, out of gratitude for God's mercy, then Christ will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. It's what we're promised. It's ours by right. It's what Christ wants to do. I wonder where you're at this morning. I wonder. I'm going to read to you a poem. It's a reflection by Stuart Gray. Uh, Stuart works with Engage Worship, and he's mulled over the themes of Advent, about us getting ready, about us getting prepared. I'm going to read you uh, this poem, and then after I read you the poem, I'm hoping, are we totally, no, we've broken down. Okay, I'm just going to re <coughs> read you the poem in that case. So let's be still and... Listen. People preparing, getting ready for the next challenge. For big change? Or maybe I'm just preparing for the feast. There's more to life than the feast. Are we getting ready for Jesus? Because Jesus has been faithful. He's given us wisdom to chart stormy seas. So I'll clear the way in my life. I'm looking for where he is. This year, I've decided. On this life's journey, I'm following him. I am his. You know, John the Baptist knew that God was coming. And he did a good job at getting the people ready. But exactly how this would happen was like a wrapped present, still hidden from view because it hadn't happened yet. Even John's expectations of who Jesus was and what he was going to do proved incomplete.
He couldn't have imagined everything that Jesus had accomplished. Healing the sick, making the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk. Letting the weak and downtrodden know that God was on their side. As we wrap our presence in the coming days, let's remember that God's ways are often hidden and unexpected. He is a God who takes us by surprise. But if our lives this Advent are to be pleasing to him, we need to make the road ready. Because he is coming. We need to sort out our rubbish, fill in the holes, remove our blocks, so that he can come to us without delay.